Ladies and gentlemen of the Shrek Gamers to the video, we're going to be discussing the technologies behind soft machines, virtual cores, and their Shasta range of processors. So there is a lot of focus, of course, on AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, and all of the other major players in the industry, well, at least the ones that we associate with the PC and consoles and the other marches of technology. However, there are other players which are putting out some really important pieces of future technology and I wanted to talk about soft machines. Now I do have a bit of a cold so I want to apologise right off the bat. Hopefully you can understand me, I'm a bit nasally don't you know, but anyway let's get into this shall we. So soft machines uh, are pretty well funded, they've got about 175 million US dollars and they really only started to announce their product lineup recently. In fact, it was only last year that they came up like stealth technology where no one really knew anything, and now, of course, are once again starting to really push the envelope. So before we actually go into what their technology is doing, it's very important to understand what typical CPU cores are doing nowadays. So, as we all know, Moore's Law is not quite dead, but it's not been as healthy as it was. Essentially speaking, Back in like the 90s, we all know that clock speeds were ever increasing and they would do things such as improve the amount of instructions on the CPU, they would increase the amount of cache, whatever, to improve performance. However, in mid-2000s, this kind of went out of the window and we started to move more and more and more and more towards multiple core CPUs. Essentially, architectures are becoming wider, so we're trying to push those instructions across more CPU cores, which is more power efficient. And we're also doing this out of order as well. Now, the problem behind this is while we are moving towards smaller FinFET, uh, sorry, sm smaller processors, which does help to reduce the the hunger of the processor in terms of the voltage required, it's still very difficult to get the most out of multi-threaded applications. As anyone who's ever attempted to write one will tell you, it can be a real bitch whether it's for gaming, whether it's for rendering graphics, whether it's for something more sciencey, it's still really difficult to make sure that the cores are always loaded and always being utilized. So for the sake of argument, let's talk about a small slice in time. Let's say one second. Now, believe it or not, a lot happens in one second. I'm certainly not going to go into the full complexities of the rendering pipeline or the processor's pipeline, but it's not like one instruction is being executed per core in that time. In fact, hundreds of, of course, thousands of instructions are being issued across multiple different cores to different parts of the system. So, let's say you've got four processor cores to make things fairly easy to understand. Let's say that those cores are labeled 0 to 3, which is how things work in computing. 0 would be the first core, 3 would be the fourth core. Now, different points in time, those cores may idle. So for the sake of argument, you might get a situation where core 3 is only at 60% load for a quarter of a second. Now that doesn't sound a big deal, but you're still leaving performance on the table when another core might be at like 90% load, and you could start to see how inefficiency would start to affect the rest of the processor's pipeline. In effect, you're basically wasting cycles. The cycles are not being used, and the processor is remaining dormant and not fully laid it down, which is fine if you're just doing stuff like using Word. Not so fine if you're trying to frag monsters at 100 frames per second. That's not quite so great. Okay, so we understand what the traditional methodologies have been to solve this. Once again, parallelism, out of order execution, increasing clock speeds, great. Soft machines. Now, soft machines are doing things a little different. Their architecture is using what is known as a virtual cores. Essentially, they are going to be shifting the scheduling and, and synchronization of the software that's being run from the developer itself or the operating system to the hardware. So, scheduling is pretty simple and all of this stuff. It's basically saying, hey, that instruction, that thread that's being run there, it's going to be run now, and then the next one is going to be run, and the next one, and of course all of those have to be executed across the right cores, so 
efficiency is as high as possible and it's synchronizing all of the results so let's for the sake of argument say that instruction a is waiting for results b and c and then all of those are put together to put together d which then would be you know spewed out on screen for example for let's say physics in a game or what have you you could be waiting the next frame of animation maybe waiting for all of those results to come back and that's why it's not good if one processor core is stalling because essentially while a and b may have been completed c may still be waiting to be finished and therefore the results of a b and c together to perform d can't be done i'm vastly simplifying this but i think you get the idea I really should put together something kind of more complex over the next couple of weeks on this, actually. I might might well do that. It could be kind of cool. But anyway, that's getting off the beaten topic, as I tend to do. I'm a bit rambly, don't you know? So, with virtual cores, it's going to be very different because, essentially, it's going to remove the burden from the programmer, the developer, who can't get things always down 100% for multiple reasons. One of them is that they just don't know what you're going to be doing necessarily at once. It's very hard to optimize for the future or for users. I once heard a quote, something along the lines of, you can develop things absolutely perfectly and then a user comes along and it all goes out of the window. Operating systems, very much the same deal. They're... <sighs> Operating systems are getting much better at multiple cores. If you've ever used Windows XP compared to the latest version of Windows, then you'll know what I mean. And obviously we've got low-level APIs, which aren't exactly the same thing as operating system, but you get the idea. However, with this, it's going to be moving it down to the processor, which will handle the pesky task of actually taking the instruction and then breaking it down to smaller threadlets by the virtual cores, and then they will then execute them on the actual physical cores. Now, theoretically, <laughs> most things are theoretical, this should mean that it should become faster and the cores should be simpler. Now, if you believe what we're hearing from um, soft machines, we should see a two to four times increase in performance per watt for the same power consumption level, or you will see a decrease in power consumption by about four times relative to the same performance compared to existing designs. So once again, let's say the performance is 100 and you, they are putting in five watts of power. They are saying that it's gonna make absolute massive differences. It's gonna be kind of interesting because as we all know, Companies like ARM, who license its cores, um, Intel, who manufactures their own processors, Soft Machine are instead going to be working in collaboration with other companies to allow them to create custom processors and system on chips, also known as SOX, which some people do confuse with APUs, but you get the idea. Now, there are going to be multiple versions of these processors. Um, in 2015, which was last year, for those of you who are from the future, we saw a visc of proof of concept. Essentially, it was just saying, yeah, this works. And then Shasta is going to be released mid-2016. Eventually, we're going to see Shasta Plus in 2017, and then Te Teho, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but it's T-A-H-O-E. And eventually, those Shasta cores will contain two physical cores running at 2 gigahertz. With a fairly titchy amount of cache, actually, only two meg, only one megabyte, excuse me, per core. Obviously, 64-bit ISAs, which not really surprising there, and will support 256-bit read/write interface. Eventually, we will start to see the increase of this, and obviously, more cores are going to increase, and we're going to eventually start seeing the transition to 10 nm. Kind of cool, right? Now. Whether this translates to reality, because sometimes there are inefficiencies about splitting operations across multiple cores, which, once again, is probably slightly out of the remit of this video, but essentially speaking, really jobifying, for lack of a better word, uh, code can be kind of difficult. So it's going to be very interesting to see whether these claims actually 
match reality. I'm kind of looking forward to this one. Guess we could only wait and see, right? Well, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Hopefully you've been able to bloody well understand me. I sound really nasally. But, well, I guess we'll see. Anyway, take care of yourselves. Bye for now. And if you can uh, do the likey, subscribe you thing, I would greatly appreciate it. Take care. Bye for now.